Hi, I'm Jacqueline Middleton, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Jacqueline Middleton. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. It's November and we have lots of great shows for you. Author interviews, writing advice, the very best people in writing today. Join me each and every weekday. You can find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. Before we get started, let's talk about some sponsors today. Writing novels is hard, but Dabble makes it easier. Dabble replaces your word processor doing what it can't. Dabble organizes your manuscript, story notes, and plot. It simplifies story, leaving more room in your brain to create. And after all, that is what being a writer is all about. Dabble was built from the ground up specifically for writing novels. It takes minutes to learn, and it makes writing a joy. See how Dabble will revolutionize the way you write with a free trial at www.dabblewriter.com. Also, thanks to our friend Mindy Tarquini and her book, Deepest Blue. From critically acclaimed author Mindy Tarquini comes a magical tale told sun to sun, moon to moon, heart to heart, and midsummer to midsummer. For fans of Paula Coella and Neil Gaiman, in an enchanted city seen only at twilight, a resentful second son unlocks secrets which could cause his world star to finally set. Publishers Weekly calls Deepest Blue a haunting, lyrical fantasy dealing with love, loss, and political turmoil. Kirkus Reviews said there's a lot to like about Tarquini's Italian inflected fantasy story, starting with her often lyrical prose. Deepest Blue by Mindy Tarquini. Thanks also to our friend Joe Leonardi, uh, who is sponsoring the show. He has a series of novellas uh, called The Damaged and Broken Collection, Tortured and Tormented, Creating a School Shooter is the first one. War Springs Eternal is the second. And then uh, the third in the series called Is Suicide Painless? Uh, Joe is a fantastic storyteller, and he's telling stories uh, that connect on a heart level that make us look at the world around us and the crazy things that are happening. And uh, maybe instill a little empathy. Uh, into uh, the way we look at the things going on. We're going to talk about them more this month as it goes on. Uh, but Joe Leonardi, The Damaged and Broken Collection, there's a link to it in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have my new friend Jacqueline Middleton on the show with me today. Uh, her brand new book is out today, and it's called Until the Last Star Fades. And this is a fantastic book. Uh, I think you guys are really going to love it. Uh, welcome to the show, Jackie. Thanks, Hank. I'm really thrilled to be here. Well, I'm thrilled to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? That's a good question. I think my first memory was I, I used to tell stories through pictures. I used to draw as a little kid. And my mom was very artistic and she would buy um, lots of paper and pens and pencils for my sister and I. She wouldn't buy coloring books. She wanted us to draw. And I think I started first as sort of like, a cartoonist. I would do little stories out of cartoons. And then I would eventually, once I learned a bigger, larger vocabulary, I'd add little words to them. So it would be when I was really tiny. And actually, my first thing that I wanted to do was to be a cartoonist. I, I love these stories where uh, a parent or a adult of, of some uh, influence in a kid's life uh, challenges them and and recognizes uh, you know these these artistic um, uh, you know gifts or or uh, you know just the instilling of those things in kids that, that is so important. I hear so many times over and over again uh, these memories that people have of of uh, of these adults that just made such an impact by just doing the little thing of challenging a kid and giving them the things they need to be creative. 
It's tr- it's really true. And I think when you grow up in a household like that, when you do eventually go on to school, um, that's why it's so great if they keep the arts projects going, whether it's, you know, art itself or music or creative writing, theater arts, because, you know, those little seeds that are planted by your parents, they can so easily be crushed when you get to be a little bit older. So, I mean, I was fortunate because the schools I went to back in the day were very much, you know, their art programs were very, you know, healthy and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, my mom would have been the first inspiration for me and, and sort of eased me along. Love that. Um, so you, you were really interested in visual arts and visual storytelling. Uh, at first, were, were you a big reader? Oh, huge reader. My Again, my mom and my dad were both massive readers and they would read to us at bedtime. So we grew up with books. I remember Christmas being really little. And you know how you would get presents from relatives that you've never met and they were just sort of a name? Yes. <laughs> um, most of the time, those presents were books. And I still have some of those books. They're, you know, little kitty books, but I still have them because they left such an impression on me. So, um, yeah, I grew up with books. I remember even in school, we had reading time. And even in my high school, I remember my grade nine English class, we had at least half an hour, we just read. Any book could be anything. Didn't have to be what we were studying. So yeah, I grew up with books. I still have all my ratty copies. I've carried them with me (laughs) wherever I've moved. Yeah, books were a big deal in my family. I love that. Um, What was the... Uh, when did you start writing stories? Uh, and what was the, do, do you remember there being, um, uh, maybe a, a story that came to you and, and that you, uh, felt compelled to write down? Or was there a character that came to you? Um, kind of what was the impetus that got you started in, in writing prose? It's really funny because I'm a really late starter. I didn't really write stories as a little kid. I would do my comics and draw pictures and make storylines. And I'd actually make them into little booklets and staple them and everything. Um, but as for writing like full on a novel, I I didn't um, until recently. Um, I got more into writing in terms of sort of journalistic writing um, in high school like on the school newspaper. And then, you know, later I was doing freelance articles for websites and magazines. Um, But fiction is relatively new to me. I only started back in um, 2015 when I started my first book to see if I could do it. Um, The the journalism, I've talked to a lot of fiction writers who started in journalism. And, um, uh, you know, we... We talk about things like uh, journalism allowing uh, you to uh, to think about stories in a way um, uh, because journalism is 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 looking for the story in a story, uh, looking for the 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 people story of what's happening because any of us can repeat um, you know the the uh, the happenings of a car wreck, but there's a, a different thing when you tell me about the people involved in the car wreck and the um and and how the people watching were affected and things like that um do you feel like journalism uh, helped you to maybe look at the world differently or to try to look at the world differently to to be able to tell the story no one else was seeing i think so because the the kind of writing that i did for the most part was health writing so a lot of times if for instance if i wrote an article about um say, organ donation, I would have to talk to people on all sides. So to try to find, you know, a well-rounded view on the people in the story. So I think when it comes to writing novels and drafting characters, I think that might be one of the reasons why I'm really detailed and I have a huge questionnaire trying to figure out who these people are, um, because you want to do them service. You don't want to belittle what they've been through. You want to make them shine. So I think, I think, yeah, I think it it teaches you to be really diligent about details, um, about the truth and about research, because, you know, a lot of stories, we write things that we haven't personally experienced. So even if it's a job you're featuring in the story, I think it's important to find out how exactly it works. So I think journalism in that sense does teach you a lot of tools you can take over to novel writing. Um, you mentioned that in 2015, uh, you, you really switched to, uh, to fiction writing with your first book. Uh, what was the, what was the, the thing that got that story started for you? 
It's funny because um, despite not having written any sort of fictional stories, I've always wanted to write one, um, but I was just kind of scared to do it. Um, so I've worked in television most of my life. Ever since I was a teenager, actually, I worked in broadcasting in Toronto. And um, one of my last TV jobs, I was also starting to write for one of their websites. So I was writing a lot of articles. Um, there was huge layoffs, got laid off, started writing full-time freelance. And the thing is with the arts community, as I'm sure you're aware of as well, there are so many cuts these days. And that started to happen in the print media here. So I was finding fewer and fewer uh, freelance writing jobs for magazines and websites and that kind of thing. Um, so I just thought, you know what, if it's slowing down, this might be the time to try to do it. So I thought, right, I'm going to try to write a novel. I'm just going to see how it goes, see if I can do it. I've always wanted to do it. My mom always wanted me to do it. Um, <laughs> so I thought, now's the time. And I kept putting it off for ages, wanting to try to do it. So I just thought, enough. You have to try to do it because if you don't do it now, you might never do it. And I didn't want to have that regret. So that's why I started it. And I had an idea in my head and some characters that I listen to a lot of music and I always kind of make movies in my head when I listen to songs. So I kind of had some ideas that have been bouncing around. So I thought, go for it, do it. I, I, uh, I'm glad that I'm not the only one that does that. I, I Some of my biggest inspirations have been listening to a song and at, at some point the song fades away and like these characters evolve and and sometimes it has something to do with the song and and sometimes it's just i don't know it just shifts gears for me and allows me to get to this creative place um so yeah i i i love that 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 happens with you um do you uh when when you start thinking about a new story um does do the characters come to you first does a, a situation or scenario or a plot line or a setting what what is the first thing that usually comes to you well, it, I think it's a couple things. I, I definitely do think of the character. I think my stories are, are kind of um, very much character driven, um, but also the settings because anyone who's, who knows my books knows how much I love London. London's my my favorite place. I love Britain. I love London. Um, my husband's British. Um, so I was about to say, you, you loved it so much you married into it, didn't you? I did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my husband's from there, um, so I, I love, and it's where I go. As whenever I have holiday time, if I can go, I'll go there. Um, not just to see family, but I've got lots of friends there, and I like going to the theater in in London. Um, so I kind of I like writing about the places that I love, and I love London. I love New York, so they kind of inspire my stories very much. Um, so I kind of already know where my setting is going to be. Um, but yeah, characters, um, a situation. What I'm kind of started to do my three books. I mean, my most recent one, that one that comes out today, until the last star fades. It's a standalone, but they're in the same world. So um, some of the people in the book may have shown up somewhere else at another time. Um, so as I've been going, I kind of have new characters show up and I'm like, I'd like to write a story about that one. <laughs> so that's kind of what's been happening with me because I kind of, I like characters in the same world. I, I really enjoy reading other authors who do that. It's sort of a little present for faithful readers going, I know that person. Um, so yeah, I mean, the setting's kind of constant because I love my my specific settings, although I'm going to introduce a new one in my fourth book. Um, and characters, I just love really char characters you can fall in love with and relate to. So, yeah. So so tell us about the first book. Uh, I believe it was called London Belongs to Me. Yeah, London Belongs to Me was my first novel, and it's a contemporary coming-of-age story. Um, it has a little bit of a romance in it, but romance isn't the main driver of the story. It's um, about a young American recent college graduate who is in Florida and decides to start anew in England. She wants to be a playwright. She loves plays and, and theater and everything she enjoys pop culture wise is from Britain. So she decides to uproot and go over there and live with a friend she knew in college and start a life fresh. In Britain. <laughs> that, that seems to be uh, a theme in a lot of your work is that uh, there's a romantic element, but it's it would be unfair to call it romance, um, that 
that's because there's a certain connotation that comes with that when you say romance and then, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a certain part of the reading population, you know, goes to the next shelf when you say that. Um, what do you think about that, that, uh, these ideas of genre and how, um, we so easily characterize, uh, stories, but when, when the truth is that there's usually a lot more nuance, uh, you know, it, it has, have you bumped up against that? And, um, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, well, this is really a coming of age story. Um, how do you communicate that to people? That's a really good question. And I think people who write love stories do come up against that a lot. And I have as well, because I've had some people, you know, make jokes about it. And I think part of the problem is people, if they hear the word romance, they think of the very, very old Harlequins with, you know, Fat right. on the cover. And, um, you know, Harlequins around today, but that's not what they're about. Um, you know, romance is a lot more today than what it used to be. And I know with my books, my books, I mean, you're right. They're, they're kind of a blend there. There's contemporary romance, but there's also just a contemporary story or a coming of age story. And I mean, my most recent one, the one that's out today, it's, there's a romance, but there's a very, very prominent storyline between the mother and the daughter. Um, so it kind of blends into fiction. I hate using the term women's fiction too, because I think, <laughs> Fiction's for everyone, and yeah. a story shouldn't just be labeled male or female. There's there's tones and um, themes in these books that relate to everyone. So if you've got a pulse, it relates to you. So um, I, I kind of I rail against this all the time, and I know people probably get sick of hearing it, but I uh, I, I that really it really bothers me the um, uh, the way we treat genre uh, sometimes, and and I totally understand that you need to know where in the bookstore to go find a book or where on Amazon to go find the things that you like. And, and, and I wish there was a better way for us to describe books, but apparently there's not because we're, we're still doing this. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the idea that, that stories have to be about one thing when life is not about one thing. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, and, and, you know, so anyway, uh, yeah, that it's, it's not just, uh, you can't just simplify things down to one. I agree with you. And, and and that's what's really frustrating is because, and you're right, if you say romance, a lot of people will turn away. And the one thing with, talk about romance for just one second, specifically, yeah. the people that are writing romance today are the in the forefront of being diverse, of being own voices, of giving truth, talking about consent. Um, you know, people talk about, you know, people ripping the clothes off and, you know, oh, and he took <laughs> me, you know, in, into the bedroom. There is an element of that, but nowadays consent is such a huge deal. Talking about, you know, repercussions of, you know, rape and all that kind of, you know, that stuff is all being dealt with in romance today, probably more than in any other genre. And I think people don't understand that, that it's a very progressive genre. It's where most change is happening. It's where a lot of the self-publishing is happening because where traditional publishers may be hesitant to carry certain voices Self-publishing has opened that up so people of from all walks of life can get their stories out. And I think it's wonderful because it just helps the industry grow. It helps readers find themselves in the pages. Um, sorry, my phone's ringing. I'll just <laughs> it's okay. Um, it's okay. So, you know, I think people need to – yeah, this is real life, folks. My phone's ringing. <laughs> um, you know, people have to realize, you know – deducting it into some small little box of what might have been your grandmother's romance is just so wrong. And, you know, there's so much to read. There's so many great readers, writers out there that are writing beautiful stories. But because if they get labeled a romance, people will walk away from them. And, you know, I, I hope people would have an open mind. And, you know, yes, we're categorized on, you know, bookstore shelves. But Please, like, have an open mind and understand these books have way more than just, you know, people swooning and kissing and sexy. <laughs> um, the the first book, A Coming of Age Story, there, there's uh, – your books are really about uh, relationships and, and people uh, discovering themselves and, and the people around them. Um, what, what about your second book? How did you uh, – because you said the, the new one is a standalone, so that, that, uh, that tells me that the first two are, are connected – more than 
than just in the same world, like you said on the third one. Um, what is, how did you continue that story in the second book? Yeah, the, the second one is um, called London, Can You Wait? And it is, that one I actually would call a contemporary romance because the romance is basically the main driver of the story, although the main characters have their own, you know, career arcs and friends arcs and that kind of thing as well. Um, that's all fully fleshed out. Um, it is connected. It's it's a sequel, but I wrote it like a standalone. So if people didn't want to read London Belongs to Me, they could jump right into London, Can You Wait? And they'd have no issues. Um, but I, I do find, um, you know, People who've read the first book, you know, get more satisfaction probably out of the second one because the characters that they loved all come back. There's some new characters that are introduced as well. And the reason I did that was, um, for one, I didn't feel their story was finished. Um, the two main characters that carry over into the second book, um, they are the subject of the romance of the first book. Um, and I wanted to flesh that out more because they're the romance is in the first one, but it, like I said, it's not the main kind of, you know, story aspect. So I wanted to explore that with them because I thought there could be a lot of fun to go through there. And and they also have very interesting backstories. And I wanted to get into that specifically for the male character because he has a very interesting story. So um, I wanted to have fun with that and just carry on. I wasn't finished with them yet. It was kind of an, <laughs> an, an indulgent thing for me to do, but I just was, I want to read this book, so I'm going to write it. And, um, so that, that's why London Can You Wait came about the way it did. When you're, when you're writing male characters, uh, since you, you brought that up a, a second ago, um, it, is there a challenge in, uh, contemporary romance or air quote women's fiction? Um, it, are there kind of typical stereotypes for men, uh, that get, they get used a lot and, uh, how do you combat that, uh, from, and, you know, we, we, we hear about, uh, men, uh, writers who write women and, and, and you, you hear things like, oh, you know, th has, has this person ever met a, a woman <laughs> before? You know, things like that. Um, so from kind of turning the tables, how do you, uh, combat that writing two dimensional? I guess it goes for characters in general, but writing the opposite sex. How do you, uh, how do you approach that so that, um, you don't fall into the same traps that, that other writers do? I've heard those stories about men writing women too, and I've, I've seen people <laughs> pull out little excerpts, and they are pretty funny. Yeah, um, I, I was trying to be diplomatic, you know. I know. But but yeah, some of them are pretty awful. They are. Some of them are. It is, they make you cringe. Um, but I, I don't really. I've never had a problem writing the guys. I, I always try um, because when I when I sit down to one of the first things I do, I do massive character work for all my characters, and I have like a huge questionnaire, and I have to know all sorts of things about them, what wounds they carry and what lies they believe and, you know, as well as likes and dislikes and how they relate to people. So I kind of treat the men and the women the same. I don't really worry of long gender lines. I just kind of, they're, they're a person. So I just sort of flesh them out as a person with concerns and loves and wants and needs. And um, then when it comes to writing them in, in terms of guys, I, I don't really like guys that are really um, sort of cavemanish and don't have <laughs> sort of some feminist views. Um, I, I don't want to write characters like that. I don't enjoy them. Um, so I try to give my guys a little bit of um, sense and, you know, to know, you know, to treat women with respect and consent's a big deal. Um, contraception's a big deal. You, you know, you read certain books where the guy doesn't want to use protection or doesn't ask or they don't have the conversation. Not that my characters have the conversation, but I just think it's important to portray those things realistically and respectfully. I think, you know, the women always have to be treated with respect. So I kind well, of you know, it's, it that way. It's, it's sad that we even have to say that, that men have feminist views. Um, you uh it's just being a decent human being it, exactly. it's sad that we even have to label that 
It's so true. But in this day and age, unfortunately, it's still happening. And I think, you know, that's the one thing women writers keep coming up against is, you know, um, and people all the time ask for recs, requisite um, recommendations of books with, you know, proper consent in them, or, you know, you want men to treat women the way they deserve to be treated. Um, and vice versa, you want the women to treat the men the same way. Um, but it also helps too that I one of the first people that reads my stuff is my husband. So if you know, I pass it through him if I'm like, you know, am I doing any stereotypical guy stuff? And my husband too is, is a really, you know, with it guy. He's not, you know, all his best friends growing up were women. Like he's been around, he's got a wonderful mother and sister and, you know, he, he comes from a really good place and he's got a great heart. So he's a good person for me to bounce things off of as well. Cause if, if there ever was an instance where I'm being like, that guy's being a bit of a, ass or whatever he, he <laughs> can flag it he's he's a good pair of eyes when it comes to that stuff but yeah I as much as I want to portray women respectfully I want to try and um, portray the men as well you know it's it's a trap on either side so right yeah I, I'm really careful um I just want them to be nice guys overall I mean they'll have flaws obviously they always do but um you know they've got to be good people basically right right so the new book is out today. It's called Until the Last Star Fades. Uh, and since we've, we've dealt with all this heavy stuff, let's, let's talk about how fun, uh, this novel is. Uh, Until the Last Star Fades moves our, uh, our world, uh, from, from London to New York. And, uh, we've got, uh, Riley Hope, who is uh, in her senior year at NYU, and all this stuff starts happening. Who, who is Riley, and and how did she and the story come to you? Riley, I I love Riley. <laughs> um, Riley, to me, I, I just I've always had this fascination with wanting to either live in New York or live in London. So I, I sort of did London with Alex and my other books, and now I'm doing New York with Riley. Um, I also write. Um, I'm very vocal about mental health awareness. And in my first two books, Alex has anxiety and panic attacks, which I also have. And with Until the Last Star Fades, while I was finishing my previous book, um, I finally started to um, go see somebody about my anxiety and panic attacks. I haven't. And I, I finally did. It kind of my books kind of pushed me to do that. And while I was there, I actually got diagnosed with uh, depression, which um, wasn't so much an epiphany. I kind of it kind of just made things sense, made things made sense. So when I came to write Riley, I kind of wanted to explore that side of mental health because um, let's face it, you don't see a lot of mental health in stories um, and even in stories that have a romance. So um, with Riley, I wanted to look at that, but I wanted to do it in a way that sort of showed people that depression is different in lots of people. And it doesn't always mean that you can't get out of bed or you terrible at your job or you're failing at school. I wanted to show Riley as this bright, wonderful woman who is so loyal to her mom and loves her friends and is going through for broadcasting and, you know, wants to potentially either be a casting agent or a director and show how wonderful she is and proactive she is. But she's got depression. So I kind of wanted to show people a new side of it and also show off New York and show off her friends and how wonderful relationships with mom and, moms and daughters can be. So Riley came from that spot because my other books, too, the main character doesn't have a great relationship with her mother. And I had a wonderful relationship with my mom. I, I lost her a couple of years ago. She passed away. But um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to sort of tip my hat to her because I've had people say to me, you know, oh, you and your mother. I'm like, no, that's not the case. My mom was wonderful. And I wanted to celebrate that. So I wanted to have a lot of, of fun with that. And um, so that's where Riley came from. Um, so in moving the story from, uh, this, uh, the setting that you become comfortable writing in and moving it to, uh, to the U.S., uh, how did that change your storytelling, do you think? Well, the first thing I started writing with American grammar and spelling. Um, <laughs> you, you dropped all those extra U's. I did. All those Canadian U's, Canadian <laughs> British slash British U's and color and, behavior. Yeah, I, I love I love 
I sounds cliche. I love New York. Um, it's, you know, and it's so close to Toronto. We, we go quite often. And um, it just was really fun because, you know, I, I know it not as well as London. I know London really well, but um, it gave me a new opportunity to go down to New York and see it in new eyes and, you know, go to different areas that I may have sort of not um, visited as much. And so it was really exciting because it was it was fresh. It was something I hadn't really written too much about before. Um, I mean, New York is in some of my other stuff, but very, very small. But um, yeah, it, it just made it sort of a new whole world to dive into and find all these great places and experiences. And it just sort of energized my writing in a sense. Being that uh, that until the last star fades is your third published book, and, and I know I know that you're working on your fourth now. Um, how do you feel like your writing has changed uh, across those books, and and has your uh, have your writing habits changed? It's it's definitely my writing has improved a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love all my books very very much, but I know if I was to write London Belongs to Me now it would be different. <laughs> yeah. um, I've definitely learned. I love, we talked about visually, you know, being a visual person and I love lots of description, but I think I've learned to ramp that um, down. Um, Cause I would write like I was watching a movie and I've realized less is more in a lot of circumstances. Um, so I've definitely learned to um, pull that back a little bit. Um, I think I've learned I've learned so much. It's, it's really interesting to see how things change. I, I think, um, my dialogue's better. Um, the plot's better. I've, I've learned how to, how to organize things a lot more precisely and be open to changing as I go. Cause I know with the first one, I was very much, it has to be like this and sticking to a plan. I'm very much a, a planner and, um, I've learned that I can switch things up at the last minute and it's not going to destroy everything. So right. it, it's been it's been a really wonderful learning pro, uh, process. And I know with the next one, that'll just continue. Like, I just hope it continue, continually gets better and better and my writing gets more, um, you know, precise. So, yeah. So the 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 age old debate of planning versus uh, writing by the seat of your pants, uh, if you will, is you know one of those things that those nerdy things that that writers talk about, and uh, and the rest of the world probably scratches their head wondering what in the world we're talking about. Um, but you you said you're very much a planner. How, do you plan out the entire story before you start writing? Pretty much. I mean, I have. Like I do all the plot points and, you know, inciting incidents and all that kind of thing. Um, the climax, all that stuff. I have everything sort of planned out, um, but it can change. Like I know with the last book and even the second book, things there were things that came in at the very last minute that I suddenly like, oh, flashbacks um, <laughs> from my second book. Yes. Um, and that was really close to the end. Um, so yeah, I do plot pretty much everything out. Like, like I said, I'll, I'll do characters first. I'm, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm working on my characters for my next one. And then, but I do know where the story roughly is going to go. And then I will sit down and actually sort of nail that and go, this is happening then this, this, this. So yeah, I, I can't do it any other way. I just, it makes me anxious if I just sat down and just, just write. I just, I have to plan things out. Gotcha. Uh, but it sounds like you give yourself the freedom that as, as the story's unfolding in the, in the writing of it, um, that, that you're not, you're not so dogmatic about it that you allow your, your personal creativity to, to kind of dictate as the story goes as well. Yeah. I, I've, cause I think things evolve. Like you might have an idea at the beginning when you're writing and it can so easily change. And that has happened with me, even with, um, with until the last star fades, some things that happened at the end, um, changed right at the very end of writing it. I originally thought I was going to do one thing and then I kind of did another. Um, and I, I think that's kind of a healthy way to do it. It definitely makes for a less anxious writing experience. Um, right. and I think it just allows you to let the characters breathe a bit because once you start getting into them, you kind of realize, yeah, they're, they're kind of going to do something differently, um, which could affect the plot and how it ends. So, yeah, I, I think for me, I have to be open to that. It, and I think that's probably the the uh, the truth for a lot of writers is that they're really somewhere in the middle. Uh, a lot of people would know um, 
for the most part, where a story's going, uh, but then give themselves the freedom uh, to a course correct as it goes. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I think very few people are solidly in either camp. Yeah, I think, you know, a good mix of the two is the way to go. Everyone does it so differently. That's what's so interesting because I, I love hearing how other people do it. And, you know, the people that can write a book in a month and I'm like, how do you do that? I'm just fascinated. I think it's it's amazing. And, you know, everybody does it differently. And that's what's just so fun talking about it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Until the Last Star Fades is available everywhere today. Um, Jackie, what do you hope people take away from this book? I hope people have a better understanding of um, the depression that's portrayed. It, it's, it's called smiling depression or high functioning depression. And it's very misunderstood. And a lot of people don't even know about it. So I hope people learn a little bit about that. I hope people fall in love with New York if they haven't already. Um, and I hope people, um, you know, call their mom up and give them, you know, a virtual <laughs> hug or, or hug them in person after reading it. Because um, the story primarily is about love and, you know, that's and all sorts of love, love for your mom, love for your boyfriend, love for your friends. And I just hope people, you know, remember that and are grateful for the people they have around them. Absolutely. Uh, Jackie, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. We're going to put a link uh, to the book in the show notes. Uh, it, is there a place online, if people are not familiar with you and your work, where they can connect with you? Absolutely. I mean, I have my website. Um, it's JacquelineMiddleton.com. But I'm probably more reachable. I'm on Instagram a lot. I love Instagram. I love photos. I love color. My feed is full of colorful travel photos and dog photos and book photos, food photos. <laughs> um, so if people want to find me, um, come to Instagram. I'm at Jax, it's J-A-X, Middleton um, underscore author. And I would love to, you know, carry the conversation there. <laughs> And uh, in the at your website, JacquelineMiddleton.com, there are links there in the, the top bar for your Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Um, Great. Facebook, I also have a private readers group if anyone's interested. They can link through there, too. Nice, nice. Well, we'll put links to all of it in the show notes to help people find you. Uh, Jackie, it's been a lot of fun talking. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Hank. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com, and when you're there, please subscribe. Up next is an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Didn't your dad teach you not to trespass? Yeah. Sorry, I'll go. Joey stepped forward, but Hedwig remained motionless, blocking the only exit. No, 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 no. Someone needs to learn a lesson about respecting other people's property. Joey felt unnerved and panicky. Please, Hedwig, Mr. Van Brunt. Please, Mr. Van Brunt. May I go now? Please? Not such a smartass now, are you? His voice grew flat and contemptuous. You little bastards think you run the world. But you have no idea. No idea where your food comes from what your parents have to go through to put clothes on your back. Humiliating jobs, long hours, going gray, to provide for you. What are you talking about? Life. Real life. You think it's easy, don't you? Don't you? Those stupid adults doing their stupid adult things while you play all day. Well, it's hard. You hear me? It's hard. Joey's breath caught. He knew what Hedwig was capable of. What did you do to Jason? Nothing. Where is he then? Jason's run away from home. I don't believe you. I don't care what you believe. I'm the adult. I ask the questions. What did you do to my son? To Zef? Is Zef okay? No, he's not. Zeph is not okay, and it was you, wasn't it? You're the one who did it. Who did what? Who twisted his mind. I haven't done anything to Zeph. Don't lie to me! Hedwig raised a hand, and a fireball blossomed there. 
Joey had never seen Hedwig's gift before. The man held a piece of hell. His face looked like something carved from driftwood, full of cracks and crevices. His eyes were shadowed and vacant, but glittering with flame, like knot holes full of fireflies. Yeah, someone's mind had twisted, but not Zeph's. Hedwig's gone batshit. Hedwig passed the fireball from one hand to the other. Did Zef send you for his things? I know you know where he is. He said... He said he was in love with you. Hedwig made it sound as if Zef had confessed to murder. Is that true? I don't know. Hedwig broke into a wide grin. Well, we can find out, can't we? He's a pension, right? A pension would know. Know what? You're not making sense. It's their gift. The pension gift? My son's a pension, like his whore of a mother. And pensions are telepaths. They always know when the people they love are in danger. Joey's eyes had gone wide. He blinked, trying to process the information. Zeph had a gift? For sure? They have a psychic alarm. If you hurt someone they love, they come running. He raised the fireball. So let's find out. Let's find out if Zev really loves you. Let's see if he's a fag or not. I know he's not. You'll see. He won't feel a thing when I do it. When you do what? When I burn you black. Joey went cold. Hedwig meant it.